Um, just a few little notes. You may see some um, evaluation sheets in your chairs. If you could fill those out after the program, they help us prepare for future programming ideas that we might need for the library. Um, but today, Eric Fuselet will bring you the history of plant evolution with the introduction to paleobotany. Also, you'll get to see some real fossil specimens from Eric's private collection, showcasing many of the species and geological time periods discussed during his presentation. <clears throat> Eric Fuselet is an environmental scientist at Olson, where he works with civil engineers and landscape architects to minimize the environmental impact from the projects that they design. He is a self-described plant geek, and Eric is an active member of the Arkansas Native Plant Society and serves on the board of, I'm sorry, serves on the board for Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes. In his spare time, Eric enjoys reading about plant evolution and paleobotany and is an avid collector, as you will see today, of plant fossils. So thank you for being here today, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, appreciate you all coming here today to listen to me ramble on about plant fossils. So um, normally I'm here talking about native plants, but this is just kind of one of my side interests and something I enjoy learning about in my spare time. So I do want to give the caveat to if I'm not a professional paleobotanist, I've never taken a course in paleobotany. I'm just a geek who enjoys reading and learning about paleobotany and collecting plant fossils. So um, I try to make sure that everything I'm including here is as scientifically accurate as possible, and I've done a lot of research uh, that has gone into this presentation. Uh, but yeah, uh, buckle up, because it's going to get exciting. So, yeah, it depends on how geeky you are, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I want to first start off with talking about different geological units of time. Um, Oh, and real quick, uh, I know she had mentioned that there's surveys in the back of the room. Also, I want to let you know that everyone here can go away with a plant fossil. There's uh, two boxes back there in the back of the room. Uh, there's enough for everybody to have one fossil if you'd like to go back home with one. So uh, hopefully that will help spark some interest, especially some among some of the younger members here. Uh, but yeah, so as far as talking about geological units of time, you know, we have different uh, increments that we try to break it up with, right? So you start off with eons, and these are the longest units of time. These last, you know, millions and millions of years, billions of years even. Uh, then those are broken up into different eras. Uh, and then each of the eras are broken up into different periods. Each of the periods are broken up into different epochs. So as we go through this, I'll try to help you keep track of what eon, what era, what period, and epoch that we're in, okay? So uh, we'll kind of revisit uh, this slide here to kind of keep track of where we're at, but we're going to kind of start off with the Archaean Eon. This was uh, right after the Hadean Eon, which is when Earth was really forming. Um, it was, you know, called Hadean because it's like Hades, you know, there's a lot of magma, lava, all that sort of stuff. But the Archaean Eon from four to two and a half billion years ago is when life started on Earth. It was pretty simple, pretty simple life forms, uh, didn't consist of a whole lot. Um, mostly shadow, shallow water, microbial mats, and this is where I kind of like to bring up the topic of stromatolites and have a collection of stromatolites including uh, well, one from the Ozarks, uh, it's called Ozarkinelia, I can't remember the exact genus, but uh, this time the atmosphere lacked free oxygen and we're going to see why this is, uh, you know, how plants played a part in uh, changing the atmosphere. So what are stromatolites? Well, you know, and to try also, just so you know, including images here from each of these geological time periods to kind of help you get a sense of what the Earth was like during these times. And paleo art's kind of one of my other interests, you know, like I put down some pictures down here before you because I just like to imagine these alien landscapes that look very different than the world today. So back here, uh, these things that you see on the, um, on the, in that shallow water, those are stromatolites and they're layered sedimentary formations that are created by photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And this is important to note because photosynthesis started before plants. There were cyanobacteria, algae, uh, that were uh, conducting photosynthesis. And so that's really why I want to start way back here when we talk about the story of plants. And you'll see how they uh, kind of evolve into plants here in a little bit. So these microorganisms produce adhesive compounds that cement sand and other rocky material to form these microbial mats. And some of these ended up becoming fossilized over time. I uh, have a collection here of different stromatolites from different parts of the world um, that you're welcome to look at uh, after the program. 
But in turns, these mats, they build up layer by layer, growing gradually over time. So the evolution of photosynthi photosynthesizing cyanobacteria evolved as early as three and a half billion years ago. So that was quite a long time ago. So we saw photosynthesis occurring well before plants were on the landscape. Uh, these early photosynthetic bacteria absorb near infrared light rather than visible light. So they produce sulfur and sulfate compounds rather than oxygen. And so think about how that might have impacted the atmosphere at that time. Very different atmosphere than what we have here today. Uh, but their pig pigments were pr uh, predecessors to chlorophyll. And that's where the purple earth hypothesis comes in. Um, there's retinol, uh, which is a much simpler form uh, compound than chlorophyll, uh, but it's hypothesized that uh, photosynthetic life forms in the early Earth were retinol-based instead of chlorophyll-based, and so that would have made the Earth appear more purple than green. And of course, there's no way to know that for sure, uh, but that, that's why we just call it a hypothesis. But just imagine going back in time and looking at planet Earth from space, and you know it would have more of a purplish look, very different from what uh, we have here today. Um, so, uh, these early life forms on Earth may have been able to generate metabolic energy from sunlight using purple pigmented molecule called retinol, and possibly, which possibly predates evolution of chlorophyll and photosynthesis. Retinol is a simpler molecule than chlorophyll, and so likely evolved first. Uh, then both retinol and chlorophyll evolved in tandem, absorbing sunlight at complementary wavelengths. So, since uh, retinol reflects purple waves, it absorbs all others, you know, photosynthesis or chlorophyll is absorbing all light but reflecting green. Um, they operated at different uh, wavelengths, uh, or they were photo using uh, visible light for photosynthesis or different wavelengths of, photo of, of visible light. So then uh, let's move on to the Proterozoic Aeon. Uh, this is two and a half billion to 538 million years ago. This covers the time from the appearance of oxygen on Earth's atmosphere to just before the proliferation of complex life. So this is where life is still pretty simple. Uh, and this is when green algae first evolved. And we have what's known as the Great Oxidation Event during this time. This happened about 2.3 billion years ago. Uh, the onset of oxygenetic photosynthesis, this is when uh, the cyanobacteria are uh, producing oxygen instead of the sulfur and sulfate compounds, significantly altered the Earth's atmosphere, contributing to the rise in oxygen. So the rise in oxygen was highly toxic to a lot of existing life forms at that time. They had been evolving with a very different atmosphere. And so oxygen was, uh, um, you know, it's a highly reactive molecule, highly reactive uh, element. Uh, so, you know, think about it. It can do everything from corrode metals to, you know, call it and go up in flames. It's, um, you know, it was uh, caused a lot of life forms to die off. So the selective pressure drove evolutionary transformation, uh, the archaeal lineage, into the first eukaryotes. And this is important when we're talking about these basic way life is divided up. You have eukaryotes, prokaryotes, archaea, these different life forms. And so this is kind of what drove evolution into the first eukaryotes. And this is when we get to the idea of endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis is uh, which a symbiotic organisms live and one symbiotic organism lives inside of the other. Um, so it, primary endosymbiosis refers to the original internalization of prokaryotes by an ancestral eukaryotic cell, resulting in the formation of mitochondria and chloroplast. Well, why is this important? Well, because around a billion years ago, a cyanobacterium was engulfed by a eukaryote. You know, and animals are part of the eukaryotes. Uh, plants are part of the eukaryotes and became genetically integrated as a heritable photosynthetic organelle or a plastid. So these chloroplasts or plastids that contain chlorophyll and in which pho photosynthesis takes place. Well, what does this mean? This means that over time, uh, basically a eukaryotic or a more complex uh, celled organism took in the cyanobacteria that could already do photosynthesis and incorporate it into its cell to where it's able to pass on these traits to its offspring. Uh, to put that another way, chloroplasts that we see inside plant cells uh, that are responsible for containing that chlorophyll and conducting photosynthesis were once microorganisms all on their own. So this is a way, uh, a process where something with its own organism and it has now since become part of another organism, uh, plants. 
so I just think that's pretty fascinating. So, and that was a beginning of plants and algae starting to use photosynthesis. So green algae, eukaryotic, we're still in the Proterozoic Eon. Um, Carophyte algae are the closest relatives uh, of land plants and encompass the transition from unicellularity to simple multicellularity, or one cell to multiple cells. And many of the innovations present in land plants have their roots in the cell and developmental biology of carophyte algae. So this is really the beginning. Specifically, they think, at least this is one of the earliest algae species they've discovered, uh, they think this is uh, the source of uh, modern land plants, but Proteroclatus antiquius. Considered the ancestor of all land plants, as far as we know, it was a green seaweed or a macroalgae that lived about a billion years ago. It was tiny, very tiny, less than seven hundredths of an inch tall. Uh, it could produce oxygen through photosynthesis. And so there are these microscopic fossils discovered in northern China, and unfortunately I don't have one of these. This is kind of like having the first feathered dinosaur, um, definitely beyond my budget. Uh, but these tiny little microscopic fossils, um, barely visible to the naked eye, two millimeters in length, roughly the size of a flea. Uh, but they found these, and these are considered, um, uh, as far as we know, the uh, ancestors of all living land plants. All right, so now let's move on to the Phanerozoic Aeon. This is the current eon we're all living in. It started 538 million years ago and extends to the present. Uh, it begins with the sudden appearance of fossilized evidence of a number of animal phyla that continues to the present day. So this eon is broken up into three eras, which you're probably more familiar with. Pale the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, which is when the dinosaurs were alive, and then the Cenozoic era, or the age of mammals that we're currently in. So starting off with the Paleozoic, uh, life began in the ocean, uh, eventually transitioned onto land during this time. By the late Paleozoic Great Forest, the primitive plants covered the continents, many of which formed the coal beds of Europe and eastern North America. And a lot of these uh, black fossils you see here are coal fossils from eastern North America. Toward the end of this era, the first modern plants um, in the form of conifers appeared. All right, so this era, we're gonna start with the Paleozoic, is broken up into uh, quite a few different um, uh, periods. And we're gonna start here at the very first Cambrian. So going way back in time, 538 to 485 million years ago. Not a whole lot was going on on land the global supercontinent of uh, Panolia was uh, in the process of um, breaking up as early in, early in the Cambrian with Laurentia, which is North America, Baltica and Siberia having separated from the main supercontinent of Gondwana to form isolated land masses. Most continental land was clustered in the southern hemisphere at this time, but was drifting north. Uh, so here I have um, showing the average temperature of the Phanerozoic era. And so as we go through each uh, time period, we'll kind of revisit this because uh, uh, plants at certain time periods have an impact on uh, global temperature. So the earth was generally cold during the um, Cambrian, uh, possibly probably due to ancient continent of Gondwana covering the South Pole and cutting off polar ocean currents. However, Average temperatures were 45 degrees Fahrenheit higher than today. And if we look at where we are today, we're actually in a pretty cool period in our planet's history. Uh, there were likely polar ice caps and a series of glaciations uh, as the planet was still recovering from the earlier snowball Earth, which we didn't really cover, but there was that time when the Earth was frozen. So while green algae were well established during the Cambrian, no land plant fossils are known from this time. However, here is an example of some of those uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, uh, which uh, I believe is up here uh, that you can look at here uh, after the show. Uh, the, what you see here, these little circular things are called oncolites. Uh, these are algal colonies uh, that form spheres or oval shapes. And this is uh, a piece of rock that has been uh, cut and polished, and it really kind of brings out a lot of those uh, you know, algae oncolites. Uh, sometimes these oncolites are preserved, were preserved with iron oxide, and that can kind of impart a red color to them. 
So it became warmer towards the end of this period. Uh, the glaciers receded and eventually disappeared. Sea levels rose dramatically, and this trend would continue uh, into the Ordovician period, which is our next period, 485 to 444 million years ago. This is uh, the climate was very hot there in the Ordovician period, uh, with the intense greenhouse conditions giving way to a more temperate climate in the middle Ordovician, uh, where it also saw the highest sea levels of the Paleozoic. So the Panthalassic Ocean covered much of the Northern Hemisphere during this time. Uh, the southern continents were collected into Gondwana. Uh, Gondwana stretched from the, e from the equator to the South Pole. The continents of Laurentia, which is uh, present-day North America, Siberia and Baltica in present-day Northern Europe were all independent continents after the breakup of the supercontinent of Panolia, or I'm sorry, Pinocchio. So this is when we all start to see the first land plants, as in the Ordovician. Evidence for the beginning of the terrestrialization of land is found in the middle Ordovician, not so much with plant fossils, but with the appearance of plant spores in the fossil record. So North America and, uh, and Europe and Gondwana are all covered with these shallow seas during the Ordovician. So um, the first plants were sporophytes. They did not reproduce with seeds like plants do. Most plants do nowadays. They reproduce with spores similar to fungus or fungi. Uh, these fossil spores are found in the Ordovician sediment, sedimentary rock, and they're typical of uh, modern-day bryophytes. So the spores they reproduced with had hard protective outer coatings, allowing for their preservation in the fossil record, in addition to protecting the future offspring against the desiccating environment of life on land. That was an evolutionary trait that life forms had to develop as they moved from the ocean to land, is how do you deal with that dry environment? So with spores, plants on land could send out large numbers of these dispersal units, which would grow into an adult plant with sufficient moisture uh, whenever sufficient moisture was present. So a lot of those spores landed in dry areas and weren't able to reproduce, but the ones that landed in the moist area, uh, you know, were able to grow into new land plants. And so what we see uh, here in this time is plants still have to stay pretty close to water. They're not able to get too far away from water. They're also non-vascular, meaning they did not have those uh, conducting tissues uh, like plants nowadays, these vascular plants nowadays have, that are able to take uh, water and uh, nutrients and whatnot from their soil and transport it to their leaves and whatnot. So this, that severely limited their size. So at this time, plants are still pretty tiny. Uh, because they were non-vascular and because they reproduced using spores, they were pretty restricted to wet terrestrial environments. This one's probably irrelevant. Okay. All right. So then we get to the end of the Ordovician and what we call the Ordovician Silurian extinction. The Silurian is the next period we're going to reach. And this is uh, an extinction that was caused by plants. So abundant plant life removed a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere during this time. Um, and so that caused global cooling and glacier formation. Sea levels drop and that reduced habitat for a lot of the marine life forms. And so you see that drop there in the global temperatures. Uh, and then that was followed by a heating event. Uh, global warming then occurred. Sea levels began to rise again, and marine animals that had adapted to those cooler temperatures were then unable to survive in this new warmer environment. So 80% of all life on Earth was lost uh, during that extinction event. So moving into the Silurian, and you'll see here this photo, I have it in the front. That would be a good, um, depiction of what the earth looked like during this time period. Moving forward from the Ordovician to the Silurian, uh, this uh, period enjoyed relatively stable climate, warm temperatures in contrast with the extreme glaciations of the Ordovician beforehand and the extreme heat of the Devonian, uh, which we'll talk about next. This period witnessed a relative stabilization of the earth's climate uh, ending the previous pattern of erratic climate fluctuations. So the, early in the Silurian, the glaciers are treated back into the South Pole until they'd almost disappeared. Uh, the melting ice caps and glaciers contributed to a rise in sea level, and these warm, shallow seas covered much of the equatorial 
land masses. And this is important uh, with creating habitat for these uh, plants that have now evolved to live uh, next to water on land. That ancient Pathalassic Ocean uh, still covered much of the Northern Hemisphere. Gondwana continued a slow southward drift uh, to these high southern latitudes. Southern continents still remain united during this period. The continents of Avalonia, Baltica, and Laurentia drifted together near the equator, starting the formation of the supercontinent known as Euramerica. So this is when we start to see the rise of vascular plants. Remember, vascular tissues are those uh, water-conducting tissues uh, that plants use to take uh, water and nutrients from the soil and their uh, and roots and whatnot and transport them to other parts of their plants, of the, of, the, of the plant. So the earliest known vascular plants appeared in the late Silurian period. These are known as tracheophytes. Think about your trachea, right? It's able to transport uh, things from one part of an organism to another. So the earliest known representative of this group are in the genus Coxonia. So these Coxonia species, and I have an example here, which might just keep it on the, I got some good photos that might show it better than the camera. These are pretty small. They're uh, typically very short, grew hardly more than a few centimeters tall. Uh, consisted of leafless um, dichotomous axes with branches terminating into a flattened sporangia. Remember, these plants reproduce with spores. They lacked leaves, flowers, and roots. Did not have any symbiotic relationship with uh, our, our buscular mycorrhizal fungal, fungal, fungi, sorry, and the soil, which 80% uh, of modern land plants currently rely on a relationship with uh, fungi in the soil in order to uh, get the nutrients they need. Uh, these did not have that yet. They had not, plants had not evolved that relationship yet. They reproduced via spores and has been speculated they grew from a rhizome that has not been preserved. Probably photosynthesized with every tissue exposed to light. So every part of that plant that was out in the open uh, had that chlorophyll that was able to help photosynthesize. Surfaces were covered with stomata. Stomata are those parts of the plant that facilitate gas exchange during photosynthesis. They take in, uh, you know, they respire, um, exhale their uh, carbon or oxygen, take in the carbon dioxide. So, and here is a, a specimen of Cooksonia from the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. To give you kind of a size comparison, here's that same specimen here. So they're not very big. Uh, you can see the fossil right here, maybe an inch, just a little less than an inch tall. A little zoom in part there. And how you tell uh, some of the different Cooksonia species apart are by the shape of their sporangia. And a lot of the um, plants from this uh, period, uh, seems like the, the sporangia and the way that they branch off uh, from each other or the way they branch the axes or how they tell these, separate these into different species. And what you get a lot when you talk about fossils are form taxa. You know, they're, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but form taxa are when uh, you're looking at different uh, parts of these plants and uh, kind of separating them out into different taxa that way. Here's another species, uh, which again have here, pretty small. You can barely see it. It's on uh, this very tiny corner of this little rock here. Very small, but uh, Salopelia, or Salopella species. Uh, also from the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. This is a form genus from the last Silurian, late Silurian to the early Devonian. Uh, its diagnostic features were naked axes branching isotomously, uh, terminating in the sporangia. Uh, differs uh, from, the uh, from the similar genus of Torticollis in that the sporangia do not have spirally arranged cells. And I believe I had a picture. No, maybe I took that out. Okay, I had a picture of that other one for you. But here's a little closer up view of this other very early land plant. All right, so later in the Silurian, the climate cooled, uh, and then closer to the Silurian slash Devonian boundary, uh, the climate became warmer again. Sea levels dropped, and the new mountain ranges that had been formed were rapidly eroding. 
And that takes us to the Devonian period, 419 to 359 million years ago. This was uh, a very important period when it comes to plant evolution. It was a period of great tectonic activity. Uh, Euro-America and Gondwana drew closer together. Near the equator, uh, Euro-America and Gondwana were starting to meet, uh, beginning the gradual assemblage of Pangaea. And this activity is uh, what caused the rise of the northern Appalachian Mountains. All right, so the Devonian was a pretty warm period, probably lacked any glaciers, much warmer than it is today. Temperature gradient from the equator to the poles was not as large as it was as it is today. Weather was also very dry and arid, mostly along the equator. It was the driest. Sea levels were high worldwide. Much of the land lay under shallow seas, and that large ocean, the Pantelastic Ocean, covered most of the rest of the planet. So then during this time, we get the Devonian explosion. And this refers to an explosion of plant life that occurred during this period. In the early Devonian, land plants ranged in size from a few inches to a few feet tall, still pretty short and small. But by the end, complex branch and root systems produced trees 30 feet in height. So the early Devonian period, we see these vascular plants. Early Devonian plants did not have true roots or leaves just yet, like most plants do today. Many still had no vascular tissue at all and did not grow more than a few inches. Probably started to rely on these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. These are where these fungi get into the roots of the system and have these relationships which are able to help with uh, passing on nutrients uh, from the soil to the roots and then to the plant, providing them with water and mineral nutrients such as phosphorus. And plants probably spread by a combination of vegetative reproduction, forming clonal colonies, and sexual reproduction with their spores. So here's an example of uh, a species that lived in the early Devonian, Algophyton. Uh, it's a vascular plant among the first plants to have had mycorrhizal relationship with fungi. Formed arbuscles in a well-defined zone in the cortex of its stems. Uh, it lacked roots, and like other rootless land plants at this time, relied on those fungi for acquisition of water and nutrients from the soil. So here, this would be uh, an example of a landscape that is covered with these uh, species and a few others as well. Also, rhinophyta, this is a group of extinct early vascular plants. Uh, and I have an example up here. Uh, their sporophytes consisted of branch stems bearing sporangia, uh, lacked leaves and true roots, but did have simple vascular tissues. So this is a specimen from Ukraine. Um, you know, I might as well just, I'll save the camera for a little bit later. So you'll notice here, uh, you know, this is a specimen that has been broken in half. You see it has that mirror formation. Um, but you can see the rhinophyta there towards the center. This is it turned on its side a little bit closer, kind of taking a little bit closer of look. And all those little lines are those rhinophyta. And these are related to um, a lot of the specimens you see in the Rhiney Chert region of Scotland, and that's these chert, um, I was trying to think, can't recall, I might have left my chert, Rhiney Chert at home, but if you find Rhiney Chert, that is filled with uh, fossils from early land plants. It's really important geological formation and study of paleo paleobotany. So moving on to the Middle Devonian period start to see these trimerophytes. What are these? This is a class of early land plants uh, believed to form the ancestral group of uh, which ferns and seed plants evolved. And it contains a genus called Silophyton. And there's a, uh, a specimen of Silophyton, uh, I believe it's up here on the table. Yeah, I don't have it back here. Uh, these plants still lacked leaves and roots. They had sporangia on the ends of their branched clusters. And here is a photo of that specimen, also from the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. A little bit closer up view here. 
And then we start to see the first trees. And this is a, an example of convergent evolution. You know, convergent evolution, if you're not familiar, is when different life forms end up evolving the same structure and form over time, even though they may be unrelated. So these trees are not the ancestors of our modern trees. Our modern trees, a lot of them are angiosperms or flowering plants, and they evolved from a different lineage and then later became, you know, took those you know, forms, you know, those trees. So here in the middle Devonian, plants uh, evolved to have the ability to biosynthesize lignin. Uh, these, that's that uh, stiff part, so those really fibrous, uh, gives a structure to the plant and that helps, uh, gives it that rigidity, uh, improves the effectiveness of their vascular systems. These lignans also allow them to grow to larger size, you know, helps them, you know, hold themselves up. It's kind of like a, a backbone in a way, except on the outside and all throughout the plant. Uh, the earliest known trees began to appear during this period. Uh, the lignans also gave plants resistance to uh, pathogens and herbivores, made them harder to chew up. So uh, this was a time when insects had started to come, evolved onto land from uh, crustaceans and whatnot in the seas uh, and started uh, to consume a lot of these plants and a lot of, um, you know, you start to see uh, um, amphibians and whatnot uh, coming out onto land and reptiles uh, evolve and so the, these plants needed a way to help protect themselves from getting eaten. I mean originally there wasn't much on there to eat these plants and uh, so they, they had it pretty good uh, but over time they had to develop some defenses. Uh, plants also de began to develop true roots and leaves during this time. So CO2 levels dropped steeply. Uh, the newly evolved forests that started to cover the earth drew a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, this carbon was then buried into the sediments. And so we saw a big cooling period uh, during the mid-Devonian. cooled by around 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's also the time we start to see the rise of these progymnosperms. These are an extinct group of woody, spore-bearing plants that are presumed to have evolved from the trimerophytes. And they're kind of a transition uh, group of plants between the trimerophytes and the uh, gymnosperms, or modern gymnosperms. All those known fossils are from the Devonian period and eventually gave rise to gymnosperms, which are, include like our conifers, pine trees, whatnot, um, ginkgo biloba, and we'll talk about the gymnosperms here in a little bit. But this is a fun word to say here, cladoxalopsida. I can only assume that's how you pronounce it, I've only ever read it. but. Uh, the Clodoxalopsida, which uh, what we think they look like, you see there in the background, these are a group of plants known as only as fossils, uh, thought to be the ancestors of ferns and horsetails. Clodoxalopsida had a central trunk from the top of which several lateral branches were attached. Fossils of these plants originate in the middle Devonian to early Carboniferous periods, mostly just as stems. An example of this group of plants is the Watizia, or Watiza, probably mispronouncing that. Earliest known tree, close relatives of modern ferns and horsetails, 26 or more feet tall, resembling uh, the unrelated modern tree fern had fronds rather than leaves, uh, which reproduce with spores. A frond is, you know, when you see a fern, that leafy part coming out of the ground, that's a frond. So this is basically a tree with these fronds on top. And if you go around to a lot of our modern ferns and look on the underside of the leaf, uh, you'll often, uh, if it's a fertile frond, you'll see those sporangia on the underside. And so this was kind of the same way, except higher up in the, in the canopy. And then we have Archaeopteris, different than Archaeopteryx, which was, I believe, the first feathered dinosaur. So when you're looking up this online or doing your own research, make sure you uh, distinguish this as a plant. This is an extinct genus of progymnosperm tree with these fern-like leaves with global distribution during this time. Very successful plant. Was once thought to be the world's oldest tree before the discovery of that previously mentioned what. Teiza genus, which I'm probably butchering. But uh, the same family is at Archaeopteris, and I just wanted to throw this in there, is the Calaxylon tree, and there's a specimen not too far, well, a few hours away from here in uh, south central Oklahoma, 
Ada, Oklahoma, uh, that has a big 250 million year old tree stump of one of these things. And a lot of the petrified wood over in that part of Oklahoma is actually from this uh, Calyx Xylon uh, genus. So I have a, a specimen here that I bought from, uh, there's a store um, called Geological Enterprises over in Oklahoma, which has a lot of great uh, plant specimens, fossil specimens. This is where I get a lot of mine because um, they sell them online as well. And I wish I had a picture, but one time I was doing field work over in Oklahoma and there was an entire house built out of petrified wood. Um, and it, uh, in this region, and I would, can only assume without going back and finding out more about it, that it was uh, you know, probably this, the same petrified uh, early, early tree specimen. So there's a lot of it out there. This is kind of near the Arbuckle Mountains. Here's a close-up of that specimen I just held up from the Arbuckle Mountains of Oklahoma. You can see those uh, growth rings on there. It looks very similar to our modern trees. All right, so now moving into the polypodiophyta. These are our ferns. These are where ferns are finally start to make their appearance on the planet. Uh, they evolved from those cladoxalopsids appearing in the middle Devonian. So you see here at the bottom where I show uh, the trimerophytes uh, evolve into these uh, cladoxalopsida, which evolves into these uh, polypodiophyta. And that way you can kind of see the lineage. Uh, these are vascular plants, uh, which still reproduce with spores to this day. Probably many species were epiphytic, meaning they grew on the surface of other organisms. Okay, so now we go into the late Devonian period. And this is where, uh, you know, we're starting to really see these uh, taller trees, taller plants, uh, and they get the, into these forests. But they're very different looking forests than what we have today. Uh, during this time, an approaching volcanic island arc reached the steep slope of the continental shelf of west coast of Devonian North America and began to uplift deep water deposits. This uh, Collision was a prelude to the mountain building episode at the beginning of the Carboniferous, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, temperatures warmed to levels equivalent to the early Devonian. And we also see as plants start to grow and develop roots, these roots start to get deeper and deeper. So uh, over on the left hand side of the slide, you see the early Devonian. Uh, plants are pretty small, pretty short, pretty shallow roots, and as they evolve, you get taller and taller, the roots get deeper and deeper. And this is important because it leads to the late Devonian extinction, which happened about 365 million years ago. Uh, this was a more of a marine extinction, uh, but all the, as land plants developed these deeper roots, they began releasing an abundance of nutrients into the ocean. Uh, these nutrients created algal blooms, much like uh, uh, eutrophication occurs today whenever we have too much uh, nutrients going into our water. Uh, that, those algal blooms consumed vast amounts of oxygen in the ocean, oceans and suffocated many species. 75% of life died off during this time. All right, so the Carboniferous period, 359 to 299 million years ago. And this is divided up into two sub-periods, the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. And keep in mind, when you hear Mississippian, we're referring to the geological time period, not the cultural time period that you might hear as related to Native American history. So that Mississippian sub-period uh, occurred from 359, 323 million years ago. There's a global drop in sea levels, uh, created widespread inland seas and the carbonate dis deposition of the Mississippian. Uh, there were two major oceans, uh, the Panthalassa, which is a large one, and the Paleo Tethys, which starts to form. Uh, you can kind of see it there amidst the um, little island continents on the east side of that um, diagram. Carboniferous was a time of active mountain building as the supercontinent of Pangaea was starting to come together. Gondwana collided with North America, Europe, known as La Russia along the present line of eastern North America, and this resulted in the Alganian orogeny in North America, which uh, extended the newly uplifted Appalachians southwestward to the Washita Mountains here in Arkansas. 
In the same time frame, much of the present eastern Eurasian plate welded itself into Europe along the line of the Ural Mountains. With the exception of North China and South China continents, which were still separated from Laurasia, Pangaea was mostly assembled at this time. Average global temperatures in the early Carboniferous were high, approximately 68 degrees. But however, cooling during the middle Carboniferous reduced average global temperatures around 54. There's a drop in south polar temperatures. Atmosphere carbon dioxide levels fell. Uh, these condi uh, conditions had little effect on the deep tropics where these lush swamps later to become coal flourished. But the lack of growth rings in fossilized trees select, uh, suggest a lack of seasons uh, in a tropical climate. All right, so this is an interesting group of plants, Equisetidae, and we'll see some modern forms related here pretty soon. Commonly known as horsetails. If anyone's familiar with scouring rush, uh, that's a, a, a modern day uh, version of this. But these Clodoxylopsida evolved into the Polypodiophyta, which evolved into Equisetidae. Calamides uh, is an example of one of these. This is a genus of arborescent or tree-like plants related to modern-day horsetails. Uh, here's a specimen here from the Ozarks, which is gifted to me by a good friend, Nate Weston. He had found this. Uh, but yeah, so one thing we'll see, this one's a little dusty, but we have a, some better specimens. This one's up here on the table. You'll notice it has these uh, segments and these parallel lines that go up and down the stem between each segment. Uh, you'll also might notice up there, you see the tree diagram, but up in the, to the upper left is what, the, what are called annularia, and these are basically these leaves that grew off that central stem of the calamites plant. So notice that trunk there uh, has these segments, kind of like bamboo, and in between these segments are these parallel lines. So if you're out and about, these are common fossils to find. Um, here in the Ozarks. If you, uh, so one of your ways to identify Calamites is uh, uh, by looking for these parallel lines and these that are segmented. So this is a Calamites cysti, a specimen from Poland, and some coal mines over there. A little bit closer up view. Uh, here is uh, where the uh, a, a cross section of where the leaves were attached to the trunk. So this is what you call an in situ um, shoot, but this is from Calamites sachier. Probably butchering that name as well. And here's a fossil of some of the Arnularia. So this is um, a lot of times when you see these fossils, this is what they look like. They look like these series of uh, uh, fireworks, maybe. Uh, it's a form taxa. Keep in mind, uh, we talked about form taxa, so that when you find these, uh, they're called annularia, so they have their own name. So it's different than our modern taxa, where we're talking about species and genera and families and all that. This is a, a form that you find of this plant. Uh, so we call them annularia, which uh, species they go to, we don't know. It's kind of hard piecing together things from this long ago. But the fossil foliage belonging to the extinct plants of the genus Calamites. We got Lepidodendrales. These are the really cool ones. Uh, this is a, a group. Uh, they are lycophytes related to the modern horsetails and club mosses, fur mosses. Um, I said horsetails. I meant club mosses, fur mosses, and quill warts. Evolved from the tracheophytes. This is an order of primitive vascular arborescent tree-like plants. Huge trees, trunks 90 feet high and up to four feet in diameter. So the coal forests of this time uh, were made up mostly by the order of Lepidendrales and included Lepidendron, Lepidofloios, and Sigillaria, among others. And we'll talk about each of these. We've got some specimens up here to show you. But Lepidodendron, this is one that you might find here in the Ozarks. It's another extinct genus a primitive arborescent tree-like plant known as scale trees related to quill warts and club mosses. And so the different parts of it 
or where we get the different taxa, these form taxa. <clears throat> so when you hear something referring to stigmaria, well, that's the root. And I got a really large stigmaria right here, that largest rock fossil right there uh, is a stigmaria. The lepidophylloides, those are the leaves. <clears throat> Lepidostrotus, looks like I misspelled that, uh, is a reproductive organ. And lepidodendron refers to the bark, and that's usually what you mostly see uh, when people are, uh, uh, have, have one of those fossils around here. So here's an <clears throat> example of a stigmaria root. This is from Kentucky of a lepidodendron tree. Here are some lepidophyloides, or the leaves, uh, also from Kentucky. Here is a good picture of the lepidostrotus, which again I've misspelled. should be missing an I in there. Uh, that's a reproductive organ. Here's another one. And then here's uh, the bark. Lepidodendron, and they, they separate out the species of these by the different pattern and different shapes of each of these scales. So these trees are covered with these scales, which were photosynthetic. So these are green. Um, they would grow up the tree. Here's another one, Lepidodendrum obovatum. Lepidodendrum loricatum. And so you can kind of see the scales. You can kind of see the little bud where it kind of comes out. Aculeatum. And another species, Lepidofloios. This is a genus of fossil plant of the same family, consisting of stems with overlapping or imbricated scars. So here's one from a collection, Lepidofloios larcinus. They're pretty similar. And Sigillaria, this is an interesting looking tree, a genus of extinct tree-like plant related to club mosses and even more closely related to quill warts. So this was a time when you had forest all over the planet or all over, you know, these large forests that were widespread, but they weren't trees like we think of them today. They were basically large horsetails and mosses and quill warts and stuff that we kind of think of with the bryophytes and the lycophytes. So, uh, but yet 30 feet tall. So a very different environment than one that, you know, assuming I could breathe the oxygen back then, I would love to just go kind of stomp around and explore kind of what that looked like. A very alien world. The Sigillaria, one way you can distinguish the, the bark of these are these horizontal or these parallel lines that extend up and down the trunk. These uh, ridges, if you get the positive uh, cast. And here's a Sigillaria strobus, so this would be the reproductive organ. Again, we're talking about these form taxa. This is uh, the part of the plant. And a Sigillaria stigmaria. So this is the root of one of those Sigillaria plants. This is also from, uh, I believe this one is from eastern Tennessee, and I have it right up here. This is the Stanhope tree in the United Kingdom. You have to go a little bit further than Oklahoma to go see this one. But this is a preserved Sigillaria tree from the mid-carboniferous coal swamps. Instead of decaying into peat, which would then transform it to coal, it rotted away but was covered in sand, which left this cast. So just to kind of give you a scale of how large these things were. All right, so now we're starting to get into seed plants, a little bit closer to what we're used to. And the seed plant plants we refer to as spermatophytes. Uh, these again evolved from these tracheophytes. Uh, and so within the seed plants nowadays, they're broken up into gymnosperms and then the angiosperms. But the angiosperms aren't gonna really come about until a little bit later. So first we would start to see seed ferns. These are no longer around, but these were these ferns that no longer produce, reproduce with spores, they reproduce with seeds, or these Teroda spermatophyta. Here's a mouthful for you. One of the earliest successful groups of land plants, and the first to develop seeds. 
these pteridospermatophyta, fossil evidence begins in the late Devonian period. Uh, remember the Devonian explosions when we start to see this rapid development and explosion of different types of plants. This is uh, kind of laying the groundwork for uh, other modern plants to evolve. <clears throat> Forests dominated by seed ferns are prevalent in the Carboniferous and Permian period, which follows the Carboniferous of that late Paleozoic era. So one of those genus of seed ferns is the Alithopterus. They first show up in the fossil record during the late Devonian, and went extinct in the late Cretaceous period. Fossil specimens are typically three-dimensional, which is pretty cool. So here is an example. This is from uh, Pennsylvania, the United States. I don't know if I brought that one, but it's interesting in a lot of those fossils is they, you get that white color on a lot of ferns. Here's Elithopterus long Thicker, which I have right here. Pretty good impression. Luckily, a person I purchased this from was able to get a photograph with light on it. It's kind of dark here, but this is basically just a piece of coal. But you, afterwards, I'll let you come up and kind of take a closer look. It's a little bit zoomed in. You can kind of even see these texture to some of these leaves here what we call the pinae, when we're talking about ferns. So you have a frond, and each of the little leaflets coming off that central stem is called a, uh, I know the plural is pinae, I'm not sure what the singular is, I think I'll look that up. Mid-carboniferous, you get a drop in sea level, which precipitated a major marine extinction. So now we're in the Pennsylvanian subperiod, that second subperiod of the carboniferous. Also keep in mind, this was a time when insects were very large. You had these huge dragonflies and huge millipedes that uh, could take out you or me. Pangaea was shaped like an O during this time. The cooling and drying of the climate led to the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. Uh, tropical rainforests fragmented and were then eventually devastated by climate change. Glaciations in Gondwana, triggered by its southward movement, continued into the Permian. But we start to see the gymnosperms pop out. This are those seed plants that uh, have what are called naked seeds, so they're not angiosperms or flowering plants. They originated from the progymnosperms in the Middle Devonian. Replace the Lycopsid rainforests of the tropical region. Remember those Lycopsid rainforests where we saw those uh, Sigillaria and Lepidodendrons and Calamites. So these cone-bearing seed plants, the conifers, or which were one of our groups of the gymnosperms, appear in the fossil record during the late Carboniferous, about 300 million years ago, with Walchia. This is the most primitive conifer uh, the Wachian conifers. These are small trees and probably originated in dry upland habitats. So this is one advantage that seed plants had over spore-bearing plants is they were better adapted to drier environments. So here's a, a drawing or reconstruction of um, Wachia, it should be Pinaformi. Uh, I misspelled that one there, but what that looked like and here is a fossil specimen, came from France. Then we enter into the Permian period. This is the last period of the Paleozoic era. I'm starting to see these weird, almost kind of dinosaurish looking creatures. So all the Earth's major land masses were collected into a single supercontinent known as Pangaea. Pangaea straddled the equator and extended toward the poles with a corresponding effect on ocean currents. Large continental landmass interiors experience climates with extreme variations of heat and cold. Deserts seem to have been widespread on Pangaea since due to its size, its interior was not regulated by large bodies of water. You know, rain had a hard time making it into the interior of that continent. 
So such dry conditions favored the gymnosperms. Plants with seeds enclosed in a protective cover uh, over plants that, uh, such as ferns that disperse uh, spores into a wetter environment. So when we see as this continent starts to form, it uh, has this impact on the direction that plant evolution goes in. So one uh, area where you can find Permian rocks are uh, in Texas and New Mexico, what's known as the Permian Basin. The start of the Permian, uh, the Earth was still in the late Paleozoic Ice House, which began in the late Devonian. At the beginning, let's see, temperatures began to warm. Began with the Carboniferous flora still flourishing. About the middle of the Permian, we see that uh, major transition in vegetation. Those swamp loving lycopod trees, the Carboniferous, were replaced by the conifers which are better adapted to these changing climate conditions. The ginkgos and cycads appear during the Permian period. A rich forest with a diverse mix of plant groups are common in many areas during the Permian. So these ginkgos or ginkgo phyta were much more diverse at the time. Today includes a single living species, ginkgo biloba, which you may have heard of. Some people plant them around here. The cycads or cycophyta or cycadophyta or a subtropical and tropical group of plants and evolved from the seed ferns. And these are still around in these tropical areas. Then netophytes, these are woody plants and only have a few relic um, genuses, uh, genera of this uh, still around today. Uh, each one I think just contains a single species, but these are uh, more diverse at the time. But an extinct order of plants belonging to the seed ferns are the uh, Glossopterids. These arose at the beginning of the Permian on the southern continent of Gondwana, but became extinct before the end of the Permian period. The most uh, well-known genus of this uh, order is the Glossopterus, and I have a specimen up here from Australia. Uh, it's this orangish looking uh, rock here. You see those leaves on there. The most prominent tree genus in the ancient southern supercontinent of Gondwana during the Permian period. So during this time, this was a very important species. And here's a close-up of that specimen I have on the table there. You can see some of those leaves. And there's the back side of it. This is one you see a lot in Australia. So the southern Gondwana and floristic region was dominated by these Glossopterus. Uh, for most of the Permian. And the ecology uh, is very similar to that of bald cypress. They lived in these uh, waterlogged soils, these wetland areas. Permian conifers are very similar morphologically to their modern counterparts or what we see here today. Uh, they're adapted to these stressed, dry, seasonally dry climactic conditions. The range of conifers expanded during the early Permian uh, to the lowlands due to the increase in aridity or dryness. Uh, the radiation of many important conifer groups occurred during the Permian, including the ancestors of many present-day families. The early conifers that first appeared during the late Carboniferous represented by the primitive Wachian conifer were replaced with the more evolved of Volzialians during the Permian. And so these are a little bit more evolved. Um, this is still an extinct order of conifers, but this group contains the ancestral lineages from which our modern conifers evolved from. The progymnosperms, which gave rise to those gymnosperms, were extinct by the end of the Permian period, so these went away. The end of the Permian is marked by a much larger temperature excursion at the Permian Triassic boundary. Uh, the Earth's most severe known extinction event, known as the uh, Great Dying, this is what this refers to, uh, with the extinction of 57 biolo percent of biolog bio biological families, 83% uh, of genera and 81% of marine specimens and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species, the largest known mass extinction of insects. 
a rearrangement of ecosystems occurred with plant abundances and distributions changing profoundly. All of the forest of that time eventually disappeared and the Paleozoic flora scarcely survived. And this brings us into the Mesozoic era. This is this new era, what we call the age of dinosaurs or age of reptiles. It's divided up into three periods, which you probably have heard of, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. I'm sure we've all heard of Jurassic Park, which technically should be Cretaceous Park if it has T-Rex, because T-Rex didn't live during the Jurassic. But. So the Mesozoic era, also known, if you're a paleo, if you're a, a, a zoologist, you might call it the age of reptiles. If you're a paleobotanist, you might call it the age of cycads, because um, this was, uh, cycads were abundant and diverse during the Mesozoic era. Starting off with the Triassic period, almost all the Earth's landmass was concentrated into Pangaea, centered more or less on the equator and spanning from pole to pole. Uh, but the supercontinent was starting to riff, not quite separated, but it was starting to riff during this period. The continental interior climate was generally hot and dry, hotter than what we have out there today, believe it or not, probably. Uh, there is no evidence of glaciation at or near either poles. Ecosystems had recovered from the Permian extinction. The spermatophytes or seam plants came to dominate the terrestrial flora. So these uh, sporophytes are starting to take a back seat, uh, a little less dominant role uh, in the plant world. Holdover plants uh, from the previous time period, Paleozoic era, include the lycophytes, uh, the dominant cycadophytes, or those cycads, and the ginkgos, ferns, horsetails, and some of the glossopterids. Seed ferns had declined in ecological importance by the Triassic period. In the northern hemisphere, conifers, ferns, and bitten Benetitales flourish. Benetitales contains this uh, very characteristic tree you see a lot depicted with uh, these Mesozoic environments are these Williamsonia trees. Williamsoniaceae would be the uh, family. There's this different species. Williamsonia possessed a sturdy stem and had multiple fern-like leaves. Uh, did not live in groups. They lived pretty singularly. Conifers were largely unaffected by the Permian Triassic extinction event, so that um, they were adapted to those dry environments. We start to see tree ferns. These are these ferns starting to look like trees. Tree ferns have a lengthy fossil record stretching back to the Triassic period. Uh, they grow with a trunk, elevating the fronds above ground level, technically making them trees. Another example of convergent evolution. So they're kind of getting the same form as those uh, lycopods or uh, lepidodendrons and whatnot. Most tree ferns are member of the core tree ferns, belonging to the families. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce those. All right, so into the Jurassic period. Here we are within the Mesozoic era. Continents were still surrounded by that giant ocean, Panthalassa, with the Tethys Ocean between Gondwana and Asia. Pangaea began to break up into the northern supercontinent of Laurasia and the southern supercontinent of Gondwana, beginning with the rift between North America and Africa. North and South America are still connected at this time. Gondwana began to fragment with Madagascar and Antarctica breaking away uh, from Africa, which opened the Western Indian Ocean. During the Middle and Late Jurassic, much of Northwest North America was covered by a shallow epicontinental sea called the Sundance Seaway. So the arid continental conditions characteristic of the Triassic steadily eased during the Jurassic period, especially at the higher latitudes. The warm, humid climates allowed lush jungles to cover much of the landscape. 
climate of the Jurassic was generally warmer than that of the present by around 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric carbon dioxide likely four times higher. Forests likely grew near the poles, which is interesting, where they experienced warm, experience warm summer, summers and cold, sometimes snowy winters. <clears throat> Unlikely it have been ice sheets. <clears throat> High summer temperatures prevented the accumulation of snow, although there may have been mountain glaciers. The beginning of the Jurassic was marked by a thermal spike corresponding to the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. The first part of the Jurassic was marked uh, by cool intervals and was ended by a spike in global temperatures of around 4 to 8 degrees Celsius. Conifers were the dominant component of the Jurassic flora, the most diverse group of plants and cons uh, constitute the majority of large trees, so starting to replace those cycads. And we start to see some modern day uh, conifer uh, families like you might recognize some of these, like the Panaceae, those are our pine trees that we have around here. Uh, Taxodiaceae, these are like our bald cypress trees that we have. Araucaria mirabilis, and I have here two forms. These are some of my favorite fossils here. Um, I have some photos here, but uh, this conifer here is a branch with a cone still attached. And then here, I have some photos I'll show here of a, a cone uh, that has been uh, dissected and polished. So you can really see these internal components. But this is a first unambiguous fossil. It's first unambiguous fossil records from the early Jurassic, closely related to the modern genus of Araucaria, uh, which are widespread across both hemispheres by the middle Jurassic. There's a picture of my daughter holding that uh, first fossil that I showed you. Fossilized branch and cone. These trees grew up to 330 feet in height. Pretty tall. Huge. Much taller than any tree we have around here. Uh, these specimens are from uh, Patagonia. It was basically in a volcanic eruption that happened. 120 million years ago in Argentina that buried this forest. <coughs> Um, of trees and left behind uh, these fossil specimens. And here is that cone that I showed you. I showed how it's been cut. So pretty interesting to see the inside of a Jurassic cone. So then we have Nanginganthus, which is it the first flower? It's kind of debated, maybe. Uh, it's a fossil plant known from the early Jurassic sediments in China. Uh, some will say that the molecular clock for a lot of our first flowers go all the way back uh, much earlier than the Jurassic. So, but as far as our fossil specimens, maybe this is the first fossil specimen we have of a flower uh, proposed to represent a pre-Cretaceous angiosperm. Angiosperms are those flowering plants. Uh, this is kind of a, what you see here is a, artistic construction of how paleobotanists or some paleobotanists would interpret that fossil that you see there. Uh, this is still debated. So uh, segments bear prominent ridges suggesting veins and a few specimens have a branched axis perpendicular to the segments which are interpreted as branch styli. Beneath the putative perianth uh, researchers interpret the existence of ovules enclosed in ovaries. However, the preservation of this region of the structure is poor. So, debated. Now we're moving on to the Cretaceous period, the last period of the, uh, the Mesozoic era. <clears throat> so, Pangaea had completed its tectonic breakup. In the present day, into the present day continents, although their positions were still very different than they were are today. South America, Antarctica, and Australia broke away from Africa. South Atlantic and Indian Oceans were formed. North America was still divided in two by that Western Interior Seaway. Now the cooling trend 
of the late Jurassic continued into the first part of the Cretaceous. There is evidence that snowfalls were common in the high latitudes, and the tropics became wetter than they were during the Triassic and Jurassic. Glaciation, however, was restricted to high latitude mountains, uh, though seasonal snow may have existed further south from the poles, or further north or south from the poles. After the end of the first age, however, temperatures increased again, and these conditions are almost constant until the end of the period. Uh, warm adapted plant fossils are known from localities as far north as Alaska and Greenland, which is interesting, while dinosaur fossils have been found within 15 degrees of the Cretaceous South Pole. So these netophyta were very diverse during the early Cretaceous. And what you see there is a picture of a modern netophyta. I don't know what they looked like. I had a hard time getting a hold of photos or drawings from the originals. Seed ferns had mostly disappeared by the end of the Cretaceous period, declined in prominence. And angiosperms, these magnolia phyta, uh, these flowering plants, uh, began to really take off during the Cretaceous. So while T-Rex was walking around, he saw a lot more flowering plants. Uh, seeds enclosed in a fruit is how we define the flowering plants or the angiosperms, unlike the naked seeds of the gymnosperms. It diversified extensively during the early Cretaceous and became widespread by 120 million years ago. Angiosperms are currently the largest and most diverse group of spermatophytes or seed-bearing plants. They make up most of the plants we have on the planet. Archaeofructus, the earliest known angiosperm macrofossil, that's not so much debated like that other one I discussed, dated to about 125 million years ago, Cretaceous period. I wish I had a fossil of it, but I don't. So angiosperms began to replace conifers as the dominant trees about 60 to 100 million years ago, and the evolution of angiosperms was aided by the appearance of bees. So plants started to develop this relationship with pollinators. That's what these flowers are for. You know, they're there to attract insects, birds, all kinds of other animals to pollinate them uh, so that they can uh, become more diverse because these, uh, this pollen is taken from plant to plant and uh, when they're more genetically diverse that helps them become more resilient to environmental stressors. And so that's one reason why they became so successful. And so of course when we start to see flowering plants we start to see fruit. So here is one which I don't believe I brought these with me. Uh, a couple from a collection of Oper Culifructus lopezii. These are from Mexico. And here's uh, another specimen. And then you start to see amber during the Cretaceous period. This is a, a fossilized tree resin. So typically coniferous in origin from conifer trees. Impurities are often present, especially when the resin is dropped to the ground. These are what we call inclusions, can include anything from plant material, insects, that sort of thing. So it's pretty interesting whenever uh, to see these things. Uh, Burmese amber is uh, one of the types that you find in the Cretaceous, uh, found in modern day Myanmar, no longer called Burma. Uh, typically it's uh, 100 million years old. Here's a close-up of that uh, Cretaceous flower in this piece of resin. So you're looking at a 100 million year old flower there. It's very tiny, very, very small. I believe it's one of those specimens right over here. You know, all kinds of cool little plant matters, little bits of leaves. Many of these are just, um, as far as the seller uh, online didn't, uh, wasn't sure the species, so they're just kind of unidentified plant material. Sometimes I even find feathers in some of these, like dinosaur feathers. And this is one of my favorites. Got a pretty good plant section there. 
All right, modern ferns. Many current families of ferns originated 145 million years ago in the early Cretaceous, this known period, time known as the Great Fern Radiation. So they evolved to cope with these low light conditions present under the canopy of angiosperms. That's why we tend to find modern day sperms in these uh, shady areas. We get Tempskia. This is an interesting thing. This is an extinct genus of tree fern, lived during the Cretaceous. They have some uh, sections of Tempskia up there. Uh, has an interesting growth habit, unlike any living fern or any other living plant. The trunk was actually a collection of stems bound together and surrounded by adventitious roots, kind of created like a false trunk. You know, it could reach up to 20 feet high, 20 inches in diameter. And these small leaves grew from various points along the height of the trunk. In contrast with most tree ferns, it typically grew large leaves from the top of the trunk. They're thought to have grown, in, again, in lowland environments such as wetlands and riverbanks. And this is a picture of one of those specimens that I have up here on this table in front of me. You're welcome to come take a look at it. Here's a little close-up view. And these are from uh, the northwest part of the United States. And the first representative of many modern trees, such as magnolias and sycamores, start to appear in the Cretaceous. Cycads were replaced by um, flowering plants about 100 million years ago, as far as, as being the, the most ecologically dominant. Flowering plants tend to take over. There are only about 20 surviving species of cycads today. Conifers underwent a major decline in the late Cretaceous, corresponding with the explosive adaptive radi radiation of flowering plants. Metasequoia is a genus of fast-growing deciduous trees, um, has experienced morphological stasis for the past 65 million years. So this is one that uh, has been around a long time and has not changed very much. There's a modern uh, species, Metasequoia glyptostroboides, appears identical to its late Cretaceous ancestors. So here is a specimen of a fossil leaf of Metasequoia. And they're cones. Pretty cool, you can find these fossil cones. Uh, this came from um, I believe Hell Creek formation up in northern United States. And then the asteroid hit the Earth. Bam! And caused what's known as a Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Sudden mass extinction of three quarters of the plant and animal species on Earth approximately 66 million years ago. So this is what ended the Mesozoic era and began the Cenozoic era. And what we see is um, in the geology, a line called the KT boundary, which is like this dark line, contains a lot of iridium, which is only known to be in space. And so basically this asteroid hit, distributed all this iridium all over the Earth. And at the same age, we find this KT boundary in the geologic record. And that's where dinosaurs are below the KT boundary, not above. And we also see this profound change in plant communities. So the Cenozoic era began with a massive disruption of plant communities. Uh, in North America, approximately 57% of plant species became extinct. And they think that uh, since many of the reptiles from the Mesozoic era were cold-blooded, uh, they weren't able to... Uh, produce their own heat, they, so they tended to have problems from fungus. And so when you get a mass die-off of these reptiles and they tend to be overgrown with fungus, it was mammals' ability and other warm-blooded animals' ability to produce heat uh, to help keep fungus from growing on us or in us uh, that allowed us to survive um, or ancestors to survive. Because uh, when you have all these dead bodies everywhere, fungus is decomposing them, uh, these other, the reptiles that did survive, other cold-blooded animals that did survive would start to succumb to those fungal infections. 
uh, but um, it was our warm bloodedness that uh, gave us that little survival advantage during that time. Because I look at uh, the temperatures that a lot of fungi uh, cannot live above, and it turns out our body temperature is just at that level. And so they reason that uh, one reason that we produce our own heat is to help um, prevent infections from these things. So it then became just as much the age of savannas or the age of codependent flowering plants and insects as it was the age of mammals. Typically, if you're a zoologist, you're going to call the Cenozoic era an age of mammals, but if you're a uh, paleobotanist, you might call it the age of savannas or the age of codependent flowering plants and insects. So the Cenozoic era is divided into three periods, the paleogene, the neogene, and the quaternary. Uh, you might have, in some older literature, see the Paleogene and Neogene referred to as the Tertiary. But that has been renamed and divided up. So we'll start off with the Paleogene period, 66 to 23 million years ago, divided into three epochs, the Paleocene, the Eocene, and the Oligocene. Now during the Paleogene, the continents continue to drift closer to their current positions. Global climate during the Paleogene departed from the hot and humid conditions of the Mesozoic era. Late Mesozoic era began cool, a cooling and drying trend. And then we get to the Paleocene epoch, 66 to 56 million years ago. We start to see some maple seeds. Acer is the same genus today that maples are in. Or these samaras, what we refer to their seeds. They have these little wings to them. This is a specimen from North Dakota. Oldest known fossil representative of the gene Acer was described from a single leaf found in Alaska from the lower Paleozine, Paleocene. A little closer up view. Look very similar to our modern day maple seeds. Zizophoides flabellum, specimen from Montana. I also have that up there on the table. What's interesting about this one, you can kind of see some of those uh, parts of the leaves. And the Eocene ep epoch, 56 to 340 million years ago. Look at that resin coming out of that tree in that picture. And it's still in the Paleogene period, moving to the Eocene. We start to see Baltic amber from the Baltics. It's about 44 million years old, and Baltic amber is. Another name, you might see it referred to as sussanite. Uh, fragments of plants are found in Baltic amber, are usually small leaves, needles, flowers, and their parts, small twigs and fruits. Uh, the amber forest of the Baltics must have been rich in deciduous trees, uh, and uh, evergreens, oaks, beech, red chestnut, elm, laurel, willow, and maples. So I have some amber specimens with these small flower stamens in them. These are very tiny. I have some very close-up pictures here. here. Let's take a little closer view. It's an oak flower. Another one. This one has uh, some close up views I can show you. And sometimes we see some pretty cool interactions going on. Here's a flower and an insect. So there's a close up. You can kind of see the flower there to the right. It's almost like a little part there opening up. Oh, it almost looks like a burr. You got this insect there. Pretty cool little ecological relationship captured. And then there's those Equisites, Esatites. Um, these are again these um, horsetails. I told you about scouring rush. This is what uh, Calamites is related to that we talked about from the Carboniferous period. You might see these in wet areas. Some people grow them. Um, 
in their landscaping even. Uh, I'm starting to see it used more and more. But here is a uh, Equicola strobus. Remember strobi or strobus were those reproductive parts when we're talking about form taxa. Looks pretty, pretty similar to the modern day horsetail. This is from the Eocene. So these are still around. Here's a leaf, uh, Salix cockerelli. Uh, so Salix is a uh, willow genus. Here's a leaf of Rus maracoides. Rus is the genus for sumax. So we're starting to see some of our modern plant families in the Eocene. <clears throat> and the grass has evolved around 35 million years ago from among the angiosperms. A lot of people don't consider grasses flowering plants. You know, they're not as showy, but they have flowers. You know, those flowers you gotta look real close sometimes, and they're a little less showy than other flowering the flowers of other flowering plants, but they are technically angiosperms. You gotta think, you know, as the climate was changing, savannas were starting to occur, and these are where grasses really took off, it's forming these um, grasslands between the trees. And the Oligocene, 34 to 23 million years ago, these mammals are starting to roam around. There was a pronounced cooling in the Oligocene led to a massive floral shift. Many modern day plant uh, forms arose during this time. Uh, the flowering plants or angiosperms continued their expansion throughout the world as tropical and subtropical forests were replaced by temperate deciduous forests. Open plains and deserts became more common. Grasses had expanded out into the open areas from the habitats along the rivers and shorelines they had previously occupied during the Eocene. Conifer forests uh, developed in the mountainous areas. And this cooling trend continued with major fluctuation until the end of the Pleistocene. Then in the Neogene period, uh, following the Paleogene, this is when the, our flora began to have a more modern appearance. It looked very, very close to what we see today. And the Neogene is broken up into two epochs, the Miocene and the Pliocene. Continents in the Neogene were very close to the current positions. Isthmus of Panama form connecting North and South America. The Indian supercontinent continued to collide with Asia, forming the Himalayas. Sea levels fell, creating land bridges between Africa and Eurasia, and between Eurasia and North America. The global climate became seasonal and continued an overall drying and cooling trend. That began at the start of the Paleogene. The ice caps on both poles began to grow and thicken. And by the end of the period, the first of a series of glaciations of the current ice age began. So the Miocene, a little interesting scene there in the background going on. Mammals are all over. So in response to those cooler seasonal climates, tropical plant species gave way to deciduous plant species. These deciduous are those plants that lose their leaves um, during the cool winter months. Many new plant species evolved and 95% of our modern seed plants evolved during the mid-Miocene. Grasses spread further, dominating a large portion of the world at the expense of forests. They greatly diversified with herbivorous mammals evolving alongside them. So it created many of the grazing animals of today, such as horses, antelope, and bison. Also during the Miocene, we see Dominican amber, which is uh, derived from the resin of an extinct tree, Hymenae proterra. It differs from Baltic amber by being nearly always transparent, it's usually pretty clean. Uh, Dominican amber is pretty nice, it usually has a lot of fossil, I mean, a lot of insects in included or insect inclusions. Occasionally we see a, a plant inclusion. But because it's so pure and clean, it has enabled the detailed reconstruction of the ecosystem of a long vanished tropical forest that existed in that area during the Miocene. So I have one specimen of Dominican amber, and here's a little close up view of a little plant part that's in there. Some unknown species. 
Uh, here's a specimen of a pine cone from the Miocene from Poland. The organic structures were been replaced by brown coal. We have another specimen here also. It's about the size of it here. That's a close up views. From the same region of Poland. And there's the Potagonium norii uh, fruit from the Zemplin Mountains of Hungary. This is a legume in the pea family. And the part you're looking at, that's the fruit, is there on the uh, right side of that specimen. Uh, it looks like it has a stem coming out the bottom and the fruit case uh, at the top. Then Zelkova, Zelkova folia. It's a genus of six species of deciduous trees in the elm family. It uh, was a common throughout northern Europe and North America as late as the Pliocene. Uh, extensive Pleistocene glaciation has combined the genus to its present range in eastern Mediterranean islands and the Caucasus, so no longer here in North America, as well as eastern Asia where only local glaciation occurred. Species of Zelkova were important elements of the vast forest that prevailed throughout the Northern Hemisphere during much of the Cenozoic period. Then Taxodium dubium. You might notice the genus of Taxodium. It might sound familiar, and that's because uh, it's uh, the same genus as our modern day cypress trees or bald cypress. So this is an extinct species of cypress existed from the late Paleocene to the Pliocene in North America and Europe. Morphologically very similar to the bald cypress and was probably deciduous, meaning it lost its leaves in the wintertime, just like our modern day bald cypress. It was once much more widespread in the northern hemisphere than today, grew in marshy woods and along streams, just like our modern bald cypress. Now we're getting into the Quaternary Period. This is the one we're currently in. We are in the Quaternary Period of the Cenozoic Era and the Phenerozoic Eon. Just to give a little perspective there. So this is 2.6 million years ago to the present. Divided into the Pleistocene and the Holocene. So the Pleistocene was those, were those ice ages. Holocene is that warmer period comparatively that we're currently in. Climate was one of periodic glaciations with continental glaciers moving as far from the poles as 40 degrees latitude. Periodic glaciation started at the beginning of the Quaternary, continuing to the present day. The Great Lakes were formed during this period. And this is the age of flowers that we're currently in. This is kind of takes us up to our current landscape. These angiosperms now dominate, making up 80% of all plant species on Earth. Modern gymnosperms are the largest group of gymnosperms are by far the conifers. So there are pines, cypresses, and their relatives, followed by the cycads, which there are still some of those around. I think we said about 200 living species. And netophytes, which there are only a few species of those still around. And then lastly, ginkgo biloba is the last surviving species of the ginkgo, ginkgo phytes. Modern tree ferns, the, uh, the modern genera of tree ferns only become evident during the early Cenozoic. They are still around. Like I mentioned, only three families, each containing a single genus of Netophyta, are still alive today. So if you're interested in learning more about plant fossils and paleobotany, I have some references I'd like to recommend. A really good book, Introduction to Plant Fossils. Find this on Amazon. Uh, pretty good, easy to read. Uh, paleobotany, the Biology and Evolution of Fossil Plants is more of a textbook, much more academic. Also out of print, hard to get a hold of, and uh, very expensive. If you're interested in learning about the very early land plants, a book I highly recommend is The Origin and Early Diversification of Land Plants. You talk about a lot of those from the Paleozoic era. And if you're interested in learning how the asteroid that hit the Earth and ended the Mesozoic period and began the Cenozoic period and what impact that had on uh, 
plants, um, plants of the KT boundary, or plants in the KT boundary. It you know, compares uh, plant communities before and after. It shows uh, the impact that that asteroid had. And then uh, some really great books I recommend that are uh, less academic uh, than uh, one of the others I mentioned, Natural History, uh, History of the New World. The Ecology and Evolution of Plants in the Americas. So this is going to focus a little more closer to home on North and South America. It's written by Alan Graham of the uh, Missouri, is it the Missouri Botanical Garden? But he's their, one of their resident paleobotanists, uh, just a great author. He's written some great stuff. He's also written this book called Land Bridges, uh, which um, is, uh, the subtitle is Ancient Environments, Plant Migration, and New World Connections. So this kind of helps show how as um, you know, these different areas where plants uh, in the New World migrated and were connected to some of these other areas. And with that, I'll leave it to any questions. Um, I may or may not be able to answer your questions, but I'll do my best if you have any. Yes? When did the cactuses come in? That's a good point. I didn't include those, did I? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I guess... Uh, my understanding with the cacti is they, uh, what are they? They're a C, you know, there's different types of photos, you know, C3, C4, whatever, and they're adapted to those. Uh, they do a lot of their, they do part of their process at night when it's cooler and their stomata open, I think then they keep them closed during the day when it's hot. I have this, like, I'm, I'm hesitant to say it because I'm going to jumble it up and get you something wrong, but I know there's... Um, there's information out there. I'll just say that. And I, I probably should have included it. I was trying to condense this all into two hours, which is hard enough in itself. So, but yeah, uh, many other questions? If not, you're more than welcome to come up and view some of these plant fossils up close. If you have questions specifically about one, happy to help. Uh, there's also, feel free to take home a free plant fossil. There's uh, some boxes back there. You can just go digging through and find one you want. Thank you. <laughs>